Uh, so Hammerfall is a Swedish heavy metal band that's touring Australia in October for the first time with a special one-off show in Melbourne. Uh, they recently released their ninth album, Revolution, and I'm fortunate enough to be joined by their singer, Joaquin Carnes. How are we? Well, pretty good, thank you. Nice to be on your show. Thank you. Um, so this can be first time in Australia. How did this come about? Well, we've been, you know, discussing this for, you know, many, many years, how to get to Australia. Problem has always been it's not really on the way or... You know, uh, it's not on the way to anything or coming from 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 uh, anything, so to speak. Mm. Sorry, the, um, uh, uh, we were doing Loud Park up in uh, in Japan, and we thought, okay, since we are more or less in the neighborhood, let's see if there is a chance for Hammerfall to go down to Australia to do one, you know, do a one-off show, and if that really works then we have, you know, the opportunity to come back to do a, to a longer tour and maybe, you know, do tour the whole country. That is the, the, the initial plan, at least. Awesome. So what can fans expect from this uh, initially one-off show? I think the fans that we have in Australia, that they have seen Ham for Live on YouTube or you know, on, on, on DVDs or, you know, things like that. So they, they know Hammerfall is a very energetic live band. And I really hope that you know, we will, you know, the, 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 the venue will be packed. We can just go in there and have a lot of fun together. I mean, a handful show is like, you know, a sing-along, a, you know, it's a big sing-along karaoke show because it, we really invite the audience to be part of the actual show, something we feel is very, very important. So how do you generate that sing-along attitude? I mean, you know, some people, uh, you know, how, how do you get people to really join in? I don't really have to because they do it automatically. Mm -hmm. The first show we, we ever did with Hammerfall at Wacken Open Air in Germany back in 1997, I mean, the audience were sometimes louder than the band singing. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. And I mean, also, they knew the lyrics better than I did. <laughs> and nowadays, the older I get, the harder uh, you know it is to, to remember all these lyrics and... Uh, I just read the lips from the audience from time to time. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's always handy. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. So I mean, also the the songs are written in in, in in a certain way. So it's it's really, I mean, strong melodies, words that are really easy to remember. Uh, so you know, it's, we invite them already on the album. Now, with your latest album, Revolution, you sort of played a bit back to your roots. You bring back. Uh, one of the producer you used in the early days, also the cover artist that you used for your first album. Was that to sort of capture something you thought you lost or just to really refocus your sound? I mean, it, that felt like the only way to go after the break we took after Infected. I mean, when we were done with the tour of Infected, we, we said, hey, guys, we need to take a break now, at least one year, to be able to to get the joy back in playing together to 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 find what was there in the first place and that was just you know the 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 joy to play heavy metal music and when we sat down and, and started to plan the next release everything just happened naturally we said okay what what did we do wrong in the past well we went through two really bad relationships with two managers that didn't work out they kind of kill the spirit so to speak and uh and we said no more managers for hammerfall and uh, <laughs> uh when it comes to the production we all agreed that Fredrik nordstrom he, he he was there to create the magic sound in the first place so we really wanted to invite him back into the uh to the the the, the mixing process and the pr pr producing process so i think we just took the best bits and pieces from the past to create the future. Mm. So, in terms of your vocal performance, you used um, James Michael to record it. Why? Why was it so important right. to get him, uh, in particular, to uh, get get your voice sounding the best it could? He was already included on the Infected album, and I think it's important for for me, a singer at least, when to work with someone that you really admire look up to and respect, so to speak. I, you know, when I heard 6AM, the debut album, the first time, I was totally blown away by not only the songs, but also the production and the vocal performance of James Michael. And when I realized 
you know, he was also the songwriter, he was the producer. I thought, hey, what the hell? If he's such a brilliant guy, maybe he it would be, you know, interesting to, to work with him. And he did the, the production for Infected, and I never worked with anyone before that made it so easy for me to perform because he could really point out, you know, how I should approach different, you know, high high notes, how to approach, you know, you know every single song. And uh, when I was done with Infected, I felt, you know what, I really need to do this again. So when we uh, sat down there and decided to work with Freik Nordstrom, I said, you know what, you can do whatever you want, but I'm going back to the U.S. to work with James. Fair enough. So... Um, over the years, you've sort of released a lot of covers. I mean, a lot of covers. You have so many that you were able to release now masterpieces with 18 of them. Why Why is right, that so, right. so prominent throughout your career? I think we really needed to... I, I don't think we really needed to point out, but this was a way to pay tribute to the bands that meant everything for us, everything to us when we grew up. Without these bands, there would never, ever be a band called Hammerfall. And... We made that clear already on the debut album, Glory to the Brave, where we included the, the cover for uh, Warlord, Child of the Damned. And we wanted to go for the more obscure bands, because covering Maiden, covering Judas Priest, I mean, that wouldn't really give anything extra to it, because they already made perfect productions of their songs. Most of the bands that we covered initially were bands maybe lacking good productions, but they had the, the songs. I mean, uh, also songs that we could re easily make our own, but we would never claim that we wrote Child of the Damned or Raven Lord by Stormwitch or Pictures Eternal Dark, because, I mean, we love these bands, we respect these bands, and uh, this was also a way to put a lot of focus, or at least some focus, back to, to these bands that were somehow forgotten. Mm, mm, definitely. Um, so you guys sort of pl definitely pl playing a star that can really be traced back to the 80s. It's really clear. But not a p lot of people are kind of really playing that when you really release your debut, the late 90s. Do you think um, in future years, when maybe uh, maybe the heavy metal style sort of dies off of the, what you've, you guys and the, some of your similar bands have been able to re revive it a bit. Do you think there could be a similar revival uh, referring to you guys, drawing upon you as inspiration? Well, that would be really uh, awkward, I think, because I never saw Hammerfall as a band that would inspire others. But, but now I realize that that, a that actually is a fact, that there's a new generation of you know, musicians, they're forming their bands, and they're, they're referring to Hammerfall as their main inspiration. And uh, that's something that the, the older people say, hey, hey, but Hammerfall, they're just doing what you know, other bands did in, in the 80s. Well, yes, but the bands in the 80s, they just did their version of what people did in the 60s, you know, <laughs> and in the 70s. So, yeah, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, yeah, I definitely think so. Uh, I think melodic metal has been uh, going down in, in the past years. Um, we've heard a lot of more aggressive bands coming around, but mm. I mean, you need ups and downs in order to to to, to proceed and to uh, to survive. And uh, a lot of bands that were around when we started, they're not around anymore. And many of the bands that inspired Hammerfall and and bands in you know in our positions, they are still around. But give it another five, ten years. I mean, these guys will be 80, 90 years old. So, mm. yeah, we, I think we're in for a big change in the, the upcom up and coming five, ten years. So you, you've previously talked about the fact that you weren't really respected as a band when you first started out. People thought you were kind of doing something that was belonged to a bit, a bit in the past. Do you think it's a matter of respect that that's the reason why it's sort of diminishing, or is there some other reason? I think it's uh, uh, other reasons that... Uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that when Hammerfall came around, this genre was more or less dead. And when we released the debut album, many people they thought, what the hell is this? Uh, this feels old and fresh at the same time. So we got you know, various reactions. But then also, when Nuclear Blast released the album, people or 
other labels realize, hey, this really works. So every other label started to sign bands sounding, you know, the same or similar to Hammerfall. And that also created like a, a negative reaction, I would say, among the, the, the fans and the, the followers of heavy metal music. So the whole genre kind of cleansed itself after that, I, I would say. And even though, to make a very long story as short as possible, I think that no matter what happens, in the future, there will always be some bands remaining there because, I mean, we've, we've been doing this for 18 years now and even though you will have some sort of a depression within heavy metal music, you know, melodic heavy metal, I think bands like Hammerfall will still be there. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> um, so in terms of your fifth album, uh, Unbent, Unbound, Unbroken, that's, um, as I'm sure some people recognize, one of the house mottos that House Martell in Game of Thrones. And you guys sort of seem to be, in terms of bringing it into the more popular culture, way before anyone else was aware of it. You sort of want to take the credit on being a, a bit on top of the ball for that one? I think I have to give Oscar credit for that because he was reading all these books when they came out and they really, really inspired him because he found so many cool like quotes or, you know, stories in there that he, uh, he gave me, you know. He, he gives me sometimes titles, you know, for songs. And then I need to work, you know, I, I just get the titles and like, where did you find this? Like, well, you know what, I found it in the whatever Fire Nice book. Like, okay, mm. well, but maybe that was a good thing that I never read the books. So I always came up with my own, in, in, my own interpretation of, these titles they meant something in the book they made also made uh, meant something to oscar but they meant something completely different to me but yes i think we were really you know uh, first to 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 uh, whatever you call it i'm not really sure what you said there but when it comes to uh, game of thrones yeah we were really you know we were out there but we didn't really mean anything. We didn't, I mean, they would have made these, uh, you know, the, the series anyway. So, mm. but like we were going to take any credit for, for the immense success that it, you know, that it had. I think that we were there to at least put some light on the books. In terms of your general lyrical style, what attracted you to more of a, a fantasy thing, especially when you, when you're starting out, you know, sort of writing, recording your first album, grunge was huge and more contemporary themes were really, really big. Yeah, I never want to bore people out when it comes to writing lyrics. Uh, I want people to be entertained, not actually knocked out or, you know, in a, in a negative way that, you know, you come back from a horrible day at work and you listen to music that will make you feel even worse. That is nothing that I would, you know, want to do. Uh, I want to, you know, tell short stories. I, I try to, um, I try to fit in uh, like a whole movie in, in three, four minutes, but I leave out a lot of, you know, blank spots for the listener to come up with their own interpretation of the song. I mean, if I write something, I, I want it to mean something different to you. And maybe if, you know, someone in, in, in Japan listen to the song, they will, their kind of the, the, the blanks that I leave out there, they will, you know, put something else in there. So the meaning can be different. And I think that is how I want to have music when I listen to someone like, like, you know, this music, you know, tells this story to me, even though it told a different story uh, originally for, for the, the, the composer or the, the lyric writer. So it's, um, I never, if people, you know, if they ask me, okay, what is this song about? Well, I'm not really sure what it, what it, what it, what it's about, but when I wrote it, it was crystal clear to me. But it's so, to me, it's such an emotional process when I write that I can't really go back and and say exactly what I felt when I wrote it. So uh, no, it's it's up for the the listener to uh, to really tell what does it mean to you. I think that is a question you always should should uh, ask like the fans okay, what what did this song tell you and uh, especially if we go back to a song called glory to the brave from the uh, the debut album that is a song that a lot of people really took to their hearts because it meant something special to them and I mean, this song is very personal to me but somehow 
I made it personal to many, you know, many other uh, people too. And then that, that is what I'm trying to do, you know, leave out some things to, to make it personal for, for everyone. I'm just talking too much here. You have to stop me. No, I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying it. <laughs> that, that's okay. Really, good. That's re- that's really interesting. I love that. A personal question from me. So Oscar, your band's guitarist, he wrote a book. Um, it, it's an English title with would be something like the Legend of Hammerfall. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. it only exists in Swedish. Is there any plans on the at the moment to release it in English or? I know they're actually they spoke about it. They might be in the progress, but. I think Oscar wants to uh, translate it into English himself in that case, and I don't think he started it. That kind of takes quite some time, I think. Mm. Uh, but I think it's in the in. They're planning it at least, but I'm not really sure when it's going to happen. But it's not only you saying this. I mean, also there's a, a big, uh, especially in Germany, they really want to have it in, in, in Germany. But that they want to have it in German, of course. That's mm-hmm. going to be a problem. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, English might be a nice compromise. <laughs> I think so too. I think so. Maybe we can just put it through Google Translate and see what happens. <laughs> it, it I mean, ma- that's the biggest joke ever. It would make for an interesting read, I, I guarantee you that. <laughs> well, definitely. I just saw a movie the other day, and I think they put the um, everything through Google Translate, so the, the, the subtitles in Swedish. I mean, I was laughing because nothing really... It, Nothing made any sense whatsoever. Yeah, I think they have um, automatic captioning software. One of the most humorous things I've ever seen is when they try to, to um, convert the wrong language. So someone was talking uh, Spanish and they tried to convert it into English subtitles and it came out with absolute gibberish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, I think it's better that you learn you know, a couple of more languages than to, uh, to do that. I mean, there are really, it's a profession to... Uh, to uh, subtitle movies, and you should really not really, you know, nah, I like it the, the, the way it was before. Uh, you know, I'd rather pay some good money to watch a movie with good uh, subtitles than this crap. No, oh, definitely. So, uh, yeah. a, cu- a couple questions on the tour, back to the tour. Um, you, you, you guys, um, it's a one-off show for the moment. Uh, is there any sort of plans to pick a, a select playlist? Uh, you know, uh, try to give the fans a, a particular uh, a, a playlist, or will it just be the playlist that you play in uh, other locations? I mean, this is still part of the Worldwide Revolution tour, mm. and since we have never been to Australia before, I mean, I think we need to. What we we always do is to include songs from every album. And I think that is more important now when you come to, to Australia to do a one-off show that, hey, you really need to, to include songs from each and every album. It's not going to be like we're doing like a special show for Australia mm. because we're doing many other countries on this tour, which is the first time, we, we, you know, we, we play. And that would, then we would need like a, a week of setup for every, every show, and that's not going to work. Mm. But I think the fact that we are bringing the tour to Australia you know, that the fans would be able to, to, to see Hammer for Life for the very first time. I think that will be, be, be en- enough, I, I think. But at least we're going to play the, the full, you know, set. And uh, th- then we see what happens. I mean, we see what happens. I, it's just going to be a big party and, you know, we're going to hang after the show if there's, you know, a bar in the, you know, around there. Of course, uh, there are plenty of bars. And, you know, Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. We, we're probably going to hit all the bars. So. Oh, awesome. So um, you have a new, new-ish drummer who joined you last la- uh, late last year. Uh, How is he enjoying the mm-hmm. tour? Well, he's been really... Well, first of all, Anders leaving the band came as a shock because we didn't really see that coming. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that creates some disturbance in the planning of the uh, South American tour and also the European tour. But, but David called us and said, you know what, I want a job. Like what? Okay, maybe you should um, come and you know play a couple of songs with us first. <laughs> and and he did, and we decided to go with him for the tour. And I must say, it never sounded better than it, it does today with with David. He he really he glues everything together. He's so solid with David behind the drums, and uh, it really made took Hammerfall to to a new level live. So it's really good, really good, fantastic. Awesome. Uh, two questions left. 
So, um, Hector, your your paladin mascot, he's featured on most of the albums. How did that, how did that progress from him being a character on one album to it being a, a, a series of albums? Was there was that a plan all along, or did it just happen that you thought oh, we'll put him on the second album as well? Being such a big fan of you know the the eighties and what happened in the eighties, we we need to keep in mind that. Iron Maiden and their figure or, or you know, mascot, Eddie, mm. he's a big influence because it's so cool that you can take any Iron Maiden album and remove the logo and you know it's Iron Maiden. The same goes for, for some other bands like you have uh, with Megadeth. Mm. I know Gamma Ray, they have their guy and, mm. and In Flames have the, uh, the Jester head, I think you call. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was kind of the, the, the main idea we had but we didn't think it was possible because we only expected you know to release one album in the first place like I said the metal movement was dead in 1996 when we re- recorded the album but when it was we got to deal with Nuclear Blast we said we want to have a character that can follow us throughout a possible career so therefore we we had Andreas Marshall uh, come up with uh, the, the warrior that was later uh, named Hector, we wanted to have a logo that really said this is a heavy metal band. And we also want to have the, we made the HF like a symbol that no matter if you see the Hammer logo, the HF logo, or Hector, you you know this is Hammerfall, and you also know that this is heavy metal and nothing else. It gets me a bit excited to be honest. <laughs> Just a heavy metal, <laughs> nothing else. It's awesome. Yeah. So, last question. Um, I read. Uh, I was reading around. Obviously, prepare for the interview. I read back then uh, that in uh, in the mid nineties, you were participating in a local music contest, uh, Rock Slugget. Is that how I pronounce it? Yeah. And yeah. you were disqualified. Are, are you able to tell me why? We were disqualified. Yeah, that's that's what it says all around the place. What? No. Yeah. I, well, I I never heard anything about that. As far as I know, I never been disqualified for anything. Oh. Maybe during my swimming career. Uh, no, but I was, never. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I've cleared that up. Yeah, I wonder what that could be. It's probably huh. just. It's probably. No, just, I think I. Yeah, I did only one show with Hammerfall, and that show was the uh, was you know taped on a you know on a video camera, and that gave us the the record deal. It's interesting how these things start. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe so you should not really trust everything you read. Definitely not. Um, so, yeah. uh, Hammerfall uh, is touring Australia in October. Special one-off show in Melbourne. Uh, they also recently re- released their ninth album, Revolution. Uh, Joachim, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, really looking forward to coming down to Australia now, finally.